So I'm standing here on the stage of the auditorium of the brand new Southside Church in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. And I got to tell you, it's great. In fact, I can only think of one thing that is missing. But that one thing is a big thing. And that one thing is you. So to tell you the truth, it's good to be here, but I'm a little sad too. I'm really looking forward to the day that we can all be back together again. And I want to tell you something. It's sooner than you think. So let's get excited. Let's not lose heart now. And if you are watching online, I want to tell you something. It is such a privilege, wherever you are watching from, that you would invite me into your place. It's amazing. Thank you for doing that. I want to start today with Psalm 19. Let me read it for you. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Now, isn't that a magnificent passage? And here's what I want you to do just for a second. I want you to take that passage and I want you to just kind of move it to the side of your brain just for a second. Okay, because we're going to get back to it, but I'm going to meander a little bit. Okay, I'm going to, you're going to think that I lost track, but I'm going to get back to it. And and this passage is going to be the center piece of our sermon. Okay, so just put it, stick it to the side of your brain for a second. Because here's the thing. When I was growing up, I had this sneaking suspicion that every morning my mom woke up and her number one goal, her like primary aspiration of every day was to wreck my fun, to kill my joy, to hold me back. In fact, there was lots of times that I would walk away from conversations with my mom, muttering under my breath, why do you always have to wreck my fun? Now, I'll bet you anything that you did the same thing. There was times that you said to one of your parents, you're always wrecking my fun, or at least you muttered it under your breath or you thought it. Like I remember my best buddy, Grant King, within about a month of each other, we both got these model rockets with launchers. They were incredible. You set those things up. Um, they had like a little ignition switch. And you, so you would step away and you would push it and, and it would ignite this little engine in the rocket. It would fly up like so high and then it would, a parachute would open and it would come down. And I remember Grant and I, we were playing with our rocket launchers for about an hour, an hour and a half, but it got a little bit monotonous after a while. Like the rocket goes up and then the rocket comes down and then the rocket goes up and then the rocket comes down. It's just like, Gravity. I get it. It works, you know? So we came up with a better idea. So Grant and I went to like opposite ends of a farmer's field and we propped our rocket launchers up. So instead of shooting vertically, they were shooting horizontally. And what we tried to do is shoot our rockets at each other. And whoever got closest to the other guy would win. Now we did lose a lot of rockets in the process, but we had a ton of fun. And I remember I made the mistake one day of coming home and my mom said, how was your day? I said, great. Like I almost hit Grant with a rocket. It was so cool. She said, what? And so I explained to her the game that we were playing. And you know what she said? She said, if I ever see you doing that again, I'm going to take your rocket launcher away. And I muttered, I walked away and I muttered under my breath, why do you always have to wreck my fun? You know what I mean? There was this older couple that moved in next door to us and they put in the only indoor pool in our entire subdivision. They came to my parents and they said, look, if your kids ever want to go for a swim, they are more than welcome. And so I said to my mom, would you ask them if Grant could come swimming too? And and she did. And they said, fine, Grant could come swimming. And so we swam in that pool so often, especially in the winter. We'd be out snowmobiling or skiing or playing hockey. And at the end of the day, we would go into this indoor pool and they owned a bunch of greenhouses. So their pool was like in a big greenhouse facility. And there were so many plants and they had the water like super hot, like almost hot tub hot. And it was so like, it was like a rainforest in there. Just crazy. And so Grant and I went swimming. But again, it got a little bit boring after a while, you know, like you swim for a bit and then you throw a hockey puck into the pool and then you dive and you get the hockey puck and then you throw it back in and then you dive. And so we got bored of that after a while and we came up with like a really great 
activity for the pool. We actually called it the most dangerous game after a short story that we had to read in English class. So here's what we did. We would bring to the pool a bunch of basketballs, soccer balls, and footballs. Okay. And then when we got there, we would distribute the soccer balls, basketballs, and footballs evenly on either side of the pool. And then we would turn the lights off and it was so dark in there. Literally, you could not see your hand in front of your face. It was awesome. And then we would throw the soccer balls, basketballs, and footballs at each other in the dark. And we had a scoring system. The scoring system was one point for a glancing blow. And what that meant is like, if it kind of like hit you, but kept going, that was one point, two points for like a, a, a full shot and three points for a headshot. And, and no one ever got a headshot in the most dangerous game ever until one particular night. Here's how it happened. I was in the deep end. So what I was doing is I was kind of putting one foot on this ledge that was about four feet down. And, uh, and I called a timeout. I called a timeout twice. I said, timeout, timeout. Twice I said it, okay? Because I had to tie the drawstring of my swimming shorts. So I'm tying the drawstring of my swimming shorts. It's completely pitch black. Grant ignores my timeout and he whistles a basketball at me as hard as he can. It hit me flush in the face. My head was about like four, five, six inches away from the concrete side of the pool. My head ricocheted into the pool, into the, into the side of the pool. And then Grant's yelling, was that a three point shot? Was that a three point shot? And I said, I'm bleeding you idiot. I didn't really think I was bleeding. I was just really mad at him. I wanted to, to feel bad. So he goes, oh, bad word. And he, and, he, and he runs to the light switch and he turns the lights on and we realize that, oh, I really was bleeding. Like there was blood all over the pool. And so we both looked at the blood and said, oh, bad word, okay? And so we got out of the pool and, and I'm bleeding all over the pool deck. And it's about 200 meters from uh, their pool to our front door. So I'm walking through the snow and I'm leaving a trail of blood behind me in the snow. And we get to the door and by this time I got like blood and water kind of half frozen on me. I look like a character out of a horror movie. My mom says, what were you doing? And we explained the most dangerous game to her. You know what she said? No more basketballs or soccer balls in the pool. So I said, well, what about footballs? And she said, no. And in my semi-concussed state, I walked away muttering, why do you always have to wreck our fun? One of the rules that my mom had that really frosted my flakes growing up was she said, um, you have to wear shoes if you go outside, which is just crazy, right? Because... Like we live in the country, like country living is supposed to be bare feet and blue jeans, right? But my mom said, no, you, you got to wear shoes. And I just hated to put my shoes on. It's, I was a hyper kid and I hated to sit still for long enough to do it because you had to go over, you had to untie your shoes because zero chance you untied them when you took them off. Okay. Then you stick your foot in and my mom wouldn't let us like jam the heel down on the shoe so you could use it as a slip on. You had to actually put your foot all the way in and then tie your shoes. So every chance I got, I would just like, run outside when my mom couldn't see me with bare feet on. So one particular day I did that. I got outside with bare feet and Grant and I decide that, uh, that we're going to build a bike ramp. So we built this bike ramp and we put it like right on the edge of the road. Okay. So we set this bike ramp up right on the edge of the road. So you jump off the ramp, but then when you land, you land in the ditch. So you get all this extra air. So fun. And so we had a contest which said like, who can fly the furthest off the ramp? And I, I think like in my second jump, I, I set the record. And we kept going and going and going after that to try to beat it. But neither of us could beat my second jump until we got to like round 20. And Grant says, man, I, I got to go home pretty quick. This is going to be my last jump. And so he just unleashed this superhuman effort. Like he went off the jump and he beat my, he beat my longest jump by like six inches. He's like, well, I got to go home. I was like, whoa, wait, like you went first, right? He's like, yeah, I think so. I said, well, I get one more chance to beat you. So guys, I'll tell you. I knew what I had to do, right? I backed up further than we had been backing up and I just gave it everything I had. I was flying. By the time I hit that ramp, it was like Mach 2 with my hair on fire. And I went off that thing and I'm telling you, I soared. Like I soared. Literally guys, I saw, like we, we were using a tree branch to mark who had the farthest um, jump. I, I saw the tree, tree branch like drift by as I went over it. Now, did I mention I had bare feet? Because that's important. See, because when I hit the bike jump, when I hit the ramp, I gave it like one more push with my right foot as hard as I could. And my foot slipped off the pedal. So I'm flying through the air and with my foot off the pedal. And when I try to bring it back to the pedal, I actually got my foot stuck between the front fender and the front tire of the bike, which really wasn't a big deal at all as long as I was soaring through the air. But when I landed and the tire turned, it pretty much ripped my big toe off. 
and completely mangled my foot. So here's the good news. I believe I still hold the record for barefoot bike jump in Red Deer County of Alberta. The bad news is I had to like crawl to the front door and tell my mom what happened. And it was actually really shocking to me because throughout the entire healing process, I noticed a very large lack of sympathy from my mom. Now, I don't know if I ever went outside with bare feet again, but I can tell you one thing, I never rode my bike with bare feet again. Now, I mention all of that to bring us back to that magnificent passage, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Isn't that incredible? The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech and night after night, they reveal knowledge. You know what that says to me? It says like, if you want to see the magnificence of God, if you want to see how awesome God is, he's not hiding. Just look around. Just look up. Like the other day I was in our new facility. I was, we have all these east facing windows and I was looking out of one of those big east facing windows and it kind of overlooks the Chiam mountain range. It's part of the Cascades. It was just breathtaking. And I called some of the other staff members over. I said, you guys, you got to look at this. Now, to be honest, um, for me, any view is great because I spent the last seven years uh, working out of a helicopter hangar and my office had no windows. So it was sort of like working out of a storage locker. Okay. But anyways, it it was incredible. So I called the staff over and, and I'm like, wow, would you look at that masterpiece? And it hit me. Would you look at that masterpiece? See, that's just God. And he's showing up and he's showing off and he's saying, I'm the artist behind that masterpiece. You want to see how magnificent God is? Just look around and look up. Like, have you ever been lying on your back on a beautiful summer's day looking up and you see the sun and you think to yourself, man, if the sun was just like a little further away, we'd all freeze. And if it was just a little bit closer, we'd all burn. Or you look at the clouds drifting by and you think to yourself, man, that's like, That's like a water transportation system. Millions and millions and millions of gallons being moved around this planet so that we get vegetation, so that we get photosynthesis, so that we can, I don't know, like breathe. Or when you're lying there and you can't see it, but the moon's up there and the gravitational pull of the moon causes the tide to rise and the tide to fall and the ocean gets stirred up and it makes it completely conducive for life, not only in that ocean, but across the entire world. And you think to yourself, man, what an intricate design. You know what that, you know what that is? That's God. And he's showing up and he's showing off and he's saying, thank you. I'm the designer behind that intricate design. Or you go to the top of the Coquihalla or the Rogers Pass in the middle of the night and you look up and, and it's amazing because it looks like someone painted a picture on a canvas, but you look closer and you realize, no, that's real. And you look at the stars and the constellations and the galaxies in this ever expanding universe and it's just crazy. Like it seems kind of random, but then when you look closer, it all kind of works together and you say to yourself, that's creative genius. And there's God and he's showing up and he's showing off and he says, thank you. I'm the creator behind that creative genius. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. It's just amazing. But then something really crazy happens in Psalm 19. There's like this complete change of topics. Because the next thing you know, uh, David, who wrote Psalm 19, is saying this. He's saying, the law of the Lord refreshes the soul. The law of the Lord. His commands are radiant, that his decrees are sweeter than honey. And you think to yourself, well, what does that have to do with the heavens to clear the glory of God? The skies proclaim the work of his hands. I, I, I don't get it. Actually, it makes perfect sense. And here's how. Remember I was saying how, like you look out the window and you say, whoa, that's a masterpiece. And God says, I'm the artist behind the masterpiece. You know what Ephesians 2 verse 10 says about you? It says this, that you are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You're a masterpiece. And when the world looks at you, God says, thank you. I'm the artist behind this masterpiece. Or, you know, we talked about the fact that you lie on your back and you look up at the sky and you think, man, what an intricate design. 
You know what Psalm 139 says about you? Psalm 139 says this, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're so intricate. And when the world looks at you, God says, thank you. I'm the designer behind that intricate design. Or we look up to the stars and the galaxies at night and we say, man, that's creative genius. Well, you know what? When God spoke the universe into existence, you were the pinnacle of all creation. You were created in God's image. And when the world looks at you, God says, thank you. I'm the creator behind this creative genius. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. God wants to show up and he wants to show off in your life. Like he wants your life to be refreshing. He wants your life to be radiant. He wants uh, your life to be sweet. Because I look around the world today, guys, and I have to tell you, I believe a revival is coming. I believe a revival is coming and I believe that you can be a part of it and I can be a part of it. And I collectively think that our church is going to be a big part of it because I look around the world today and I think to myself, man, we need refreshing. Don't we? Like we live in an exhausted world. We live in an anxious world. We live in a stressed out world and God wants to show up and show off through you and bring refreshment to a world that desperately needs it. We live in a world that feels like it's stumbling around in the dark sometimes. Lost, afraid, and unsure. And this world needs light. And I believe that God wants to show up and show off through you and bring that light. And we live in a world right now that really needs some sweetness because we, we've had enough of bitterness. We've had enough of anger. We ha- we've had enough of enmity. We've had enough of hatred. It's time for some sweetness. And I really believe that God wants to show up and show off through you and bring sweetness to a world that desperately needs it. And and so I want to bring you back to this truth. God wants to show up and show off through you. Okay. But, but, but it says this, that the, the law of the Lord is refreshing. It refreshes the soul. His commands are radiant that his decrees are sweeter than honey. Now I mentioned that to you because I think there's sometimes that we have a tendency when we hear words like this, law, decree, command, we can be tempted to look at God the way that I used to look at my mom. And we read those things and we walk away mumbling under our breath, God, why do you have to wreck all my fun? It should be noted, something you've already probably figured out, by the way, I have an awesome mom. And my mom's only goal in my life was to show up and show off. First of all, she wanted to show up, i.e. she wanted to be there to somehow keep me alive to experience adulthood. And she wanted to show off. In other words, I think my mom always knew that God had an amazing story to tell through me. And not a day goes by even up to this day that when I'm living my life, I don't think to myself, man, I'd love to make my mom and my dad proud. God's the same way with you. When he gives you his laws, his decrees and his commands, he's not doing it to wreck your fun. He's doing it to show up and show off. See, in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus said this, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them to practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then the rains came down and the floods came out and came up and and, and the wind blew, but the house still stood. Like even in the rain and even in the floods and even in the wind, the house stood, even in the COVID, even in the pandemic, even in the restrictions, even in the lockdown, the house still stood. And that's so important. But Jesus said, if you hear these words of mine and you don't put them into practice, you're like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. It looked really good, right? But then the rains came down and the floods came up and the wind blew and it all fell. So when adversity struck, everything fell down. So God wants to show up in your life. He wants you to live the life that you were created to really live. But he also wants to show off. Here's what I mean by that. I really believe that you were created to have your soul refreshed and to bring refreshment. I really believe that you were created to be radiant, to have God's light shine on you, to shine light in this world. I really believe that you were created to have his sweetness poured into you so that you can be uh, a a source of sweetness to a world that desperately needs it. So I I just want to suggest again to you guys, there's, there's a revival coming. There's a revival coming. God's moving. God has some plans right now because I don't think our world has ever needed refreshment more than it needs refreshment right now. I don't think our world has ever needed radiance more than our world needs radiance right now. I don't think our world has ever needed sweetness as much as our world needs sweetness right now. There's a revival coming. And and here's my question. Do you want to be a part of it? Because I do. 
I think he's calling to you and me individually and to us collectively to be a part of this revival because it's coming. And God just wants to show up and show off in our lives. And that's how he's going to usher in revival. So the law of the Lord refreshes the soul. His commands are radiant. His decrees are sweeter than honey. I'm going to just give you three examples that I think are really, really important for today right now. So number one, the Bible says, be grateful, be grateful. First Thessalonians five says it this way, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Be thankful. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord. Always. I will say it again. Rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Be thankful grateful. And when God says, be grateful, he's not trying to wreck your fun. He's just trying to show up and show off in your life because he knows something about you. He's showing up and he's letting you know, you don't want to live a grumbling life. You really have a decision. You can be grateful or you can grumble. It really is a decision. You can make it because if you look around the world for something to grumble about, you will never actually run out. But if you look around the world for something to be grateful for, you will never run out. So you choose. God says, if you really want to live your life, you got to be grateful. Be grateful. And God wants to show off through your life. Man, grateful people, grateful people are attractive. Grateful people are magnetic. Grateful people are way more creative and way more innovative. When grateful people are faced with a challenge or an obstacle, they live on the solution side of that challenge. Grumbling people, when faced with with an obstacle or a challenge, they live on the problem side of that issue. So be grateful. Not because God wants to wreck your fun, but because he wants to usher in a revival through you and through me. Secondly, the Bible says, be grateful content. Be content. The 10th of the 10 commandments in the old Testament says this, do not covet. In other words, like, don't worry about having all the stuff that your neighbor has. Proverbs 14 says this, says envy rots the bones. In other words, it makes you sick. First Corinthians chapter 13 is a pretty famous chapter in the Bible. People know it as the love chapter. And the apostle Paul writes it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he describes love because it's really important because Jesus said, people are going to know that you love me by the way that you love others. And so the apostle Paul really breaks it down. And he says it this way. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. So be content. And when God says be content, he's not trying to wreck your fun. He's trying to show up and show off in your life. He's trying to usher in a revival through you. Be content content. God wants to show up in your life. He wants to let you know you don't want to live a jealous life. You don't want to live a discontented life because that's no kind of life to live. Like remember this, that God is the artist. You're the masterpiece. God is the designer. You're the design. God is the creator. You're the created. And he's given you a life and he's given you gifts and he's given you abilities and he's given you opportunities and he's given you a story to tell. How heartbreaking must it be for God to look at you or look at me and see that we spend our entire lives just wishing that we could tell that person's story instead, that we could be that person instead, that we could have that person's stuff instead. The only thing that I can think that might describe it is when I think of my own six kids, Tori, Lucas, Emma, Gabe, Bedza, Samuel, every one of them is beautiful to me. Every one of them is so uniquely gifted. And I just can't imagine what it'd be like if they spent their entire lives thinking, man, I just, I want to be like him. I don't want to be me. God shows up and says, be content because you know what? It's a choice. You can actually choose to be content and not to be jealous and discontented. And if there's things in your life right now that are causing you to be jealous, that are causing you to envy, that are causing you to be discontented, I would suggest that you make a decision today, right now in this moment to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing that makes you jealous. Be content. God wants to show up in your life. He also wants to show off in your life. See, here's the great thing about content people. I just love content people. People that are content with being themselves, comfortable in their own skin. Don't you love it? Because then they can celebrate other people. Man, I love that. I've been very fortunate in my life. I've never walked around and I've never looked at somebody else and said, man, that person has it better than me. Because honestly, I don't believe that they do. I'm so thankful to be me. And I'm so thankful that you're you. And when you get to that point of contentness, you're going through life and you're telling your own story. 
and you look beside me and there's someone over there and they're telling their own story and it's beautiful. And maybe you look at their story and theirs is a summer blockbuster and it's way more higher budget than yours and has way more actors in it and, and a way wider audience than yours. And yours is just an art house film. Lower budget, smaller audience, but you love it because it's your story and you're telling it and you look at them and you're like, you go, you tell your story. I love it. And they're cheering you on. And God says, I want to show off in your life like that. Be grateful, be content. And finally, God says, be generous. Not because he wants to wreck your fun, but because he wants to show up and he wants to show off in your life. And it really is a choice, right? You can choose to be open-handed or you can choose to be tight-fisted. It's really up to you. But when God says be generous, he wants to show up in your life. He wants to say, look, well, Jesus said it this way. If you want to find your life, lose yourself. Because what would it profit a person to gain the whole world, but lose their soul? Another translation says it this way. What would it profit a person to gain the whole world, but lose you, the real you? See, you were born to make a difference. You were born to lend a helping hand. And, and when you do, you're going to find a life worth living. God wants to show up in your life, but he also wants to show off through your generosity. Man, there's something just compelling about generosity. Isaiah 58 says that when we help the helpless and when we feed the hung hungry, our light will shine in the darkness. Let me say that again. When we help the helpless and when we feed the hungry, our light will shine in the darkness. Man, I look back at my life and I think about that old phrase that says, we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. I look back at my life with Corinne and I just think of all the opportunities that we've had in our life to be exuberantly, enthusiastically generous. Man, we've never just been 10% givers. We just never have been. We've always been over and above givers and we're exuberant about it. We're enthusiastic about it. We're so grateful for the opportunity. Like it's easy to stand up here on a stage like this and I hope you're here soon. But it's easy for me to stand here and say, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. But I'm telling you, you can't. I've tried it. I've tried it. He's faithful. He's so faithful. And this whole concept of blessed to be a blessing, I've seen it play out over and over in my life. Do you see how it's circular? I'm blessed. And then I am a blessing. And because I am a blessing, I'm blessed. And then I have the opportunity to be a blessing. And because I am a blessing, I'm blessed. And it's good. And God says, be grateful. Be content. Be generous. And by the way, if you want to be a part of what we're doing at Southside Church, we're here to feed the hungry spiritually and physically. We're here to help the helpless spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And I would love it if you would give to Southside Church. You can text the keyword give, G-I-V-E to 604-670-3040. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do this. Let's do this generosity thing. Your light will shine in the darkness. Here's what I know. Here's what, listen to me. Listen to me. There's a revival coming. There's a revival coming. Our world has never needed refreshment like our world needs refreshment right now. That's on you and that's on me as God shows up and shows off in our life. Our world has never needed radiance like our world needs radiance right now. That's on you and that's on me and that's on us as God shows up and shows off in our life. And the world has never needed sweetness as much as the world needs sweetness right now. And that's on you and that's on me and that's on us as God shows up and shows off in our lives. I love the way that Tozer put it. He said this, it's going to take more than talk and prayer to bring revival. There must be a return to the Lord in practice. There's a revival coming and God comes with his laws, his commands and his decrees not to wreck your fun, but to show up and to show off and guys buckle up because I can't wait. It's going to be incredible because I hear so many people lately saying, whoa, 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 hey, 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 hey. Don't talk about going back to normal. Don't talk about going back to normal because here's what you need to understand. Like we're never really going to go back to normal. You know what? That's right. That's exactly right. We're never going to go back to exactly normal. It's going to be better. 
It's going to be better than it ever has because for this Christian and for this church, here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to stand around our entire lives waiting to die and go to heaven because our Lord and Savior taught us to pray this way. God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Revival is his will. So you're right. It's not going to go back to exactly normal. It's going to be better and we get to be a part of it. And I can not wait to see God show up and show off in your life, in my life, and in our lives collectively. So just as I close today, I want to say this. The first step in having God show up and show off in your life, he's got a story to tell in you. He's got a story to tell through you. And the first step is to just accept his help. You know, God sent his son, Jesus, into human history. And he died on a cross so that we don't have to carry around the baggage of our mistakes and our sins anymore. And he rose again so that we can have the strength for his radiance, for his sweetness, for his refreshment to shine through our lives. When we're weak, he's strong. When we're unable, he's able. And it all starts by accepting that gift of Jesus' death and resurrection. So if today is the day that you want to accept that, let me pray out loud. Wherever you are right now, just pray along with me, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for today. Jesus, I want to thank you that you came and you died. Today, Jesus, I ask you to be my savior. That you would forgive my sins and give me a clean slate and a fresh start right now. But Jesus, thank you that you didn't just die, but you rose again. And I pray that you would be the Lord of my life, that you would lead me into the story that you want to tell. I pray that you would show up and show off through my life. Today, tomorrow, and forever. Thank you. I love you. I pray this in your name. Amen. And by the way, before I close, I just really want to pray for the rest of us. Okay, can I pray for all of us real quick? Okay. God, we need you. This has been a long 13 months and I sense we're on the edge of a revival. So I pray sincerely on behalf of everyone who calls Southside Church home. God, I pray that you would show up in our lives, that you would lead us in the way that we should go and you would show off that you would bring radiance through us, that you would bring sweetness through us, that you would bring refreshment through us, that we would be part of this revival to a world that desperately, desperately needs you. Father, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you that the best really is yet to come and we're not going back to the same. We're going back to better in your name. Amen. Amen. Guys, I love you so much. I'm telling you, listen to me, listen to me. It's going to get good. No, I'm serious. It's going to get good. Let's get ready. I can't wait to run this race with you. I can't wait to watch this revival, to usher in this revival with you. We'll see you next week.